And let's continue our worship this morning by looking at the book of Jonah. We're going to be in Jonah chapter 1, looking at verses uh, 4 through 17. If you can't find the book of Jonah, it's in the Minor Prophets. I went to seminary, so can't remember the order of those either. So (laughs) don't feel too bad about yourself if you need to look in your table of contents for the book of Jonah. It's only four chapters long and very short. Well, I don't know if there are movies that kind of stick with you, uh, maybe a song that you've heard at one point that when you listen to it, it takes you back to a certain time in life, you know, and we all have those things and, and maybe you're a reader and maybe there are books that just kind of linger long past you get to the last page and you can't help but to reflect upon those truths. There was a book I read a number of years ago and it was called A Severe Mercy. It's written by a man named Sheldon Vanocken. He's uh, kind of a literary scholar out of Oxford, uh, writes it in a very poetic way. In some ways, it's a little difficult to read, but I've told many people that I think it is by far one of the best books I've ever read on the idea of suffering and how we encounter Christ in our trials and tribulation. And so the story's told about young Sheldon. He meets a young lady named Davy, and they fall deeply in love, and they uh, really kind of build this what they call shining barrier around their love. They eventually, of course, get married, and they live in such a way where they're literally just kind of infatuated with each other. This is the part, honestly, it's a little hard to read as you read about their love. And the way he describes it, he describes this shining barrier. It was sort of a fence around a young tree to keep the deer from nibbling on it. It was a defense against the creeping separateness of what he would describe to be an enemy to their love. And and in a large part, it was kind of self-centered and very selfish, although they were enraptured with each other. They had this long-sought goal to get a boat and to sail the world. They did not want to have children. They didn't want to do anything that would infringe upon that barrier and that walled garden of their love. And the story really begins to pick up steam whenever Davy has an encounter with Christ. And she becomes a believer in Jesus. She becomes a Christian. And I wish I could say that Sheldon was just really excited about this development in the relationship, but frankly, he wasn't. Because Christ began to intrude in ways that only he can upon their love. And Sheldon eventually comes to faith in Jesus as well, but his journey is a lot longer. And one of the ways that he encounters Christ is through suffering. Because it was when they were at Oxford and Sheldon was studying in, um, uh, to, to, in, uh, in, in literature, and he met a man that you might know and be familiar with. His name is C.S. Lewis, who was a professor then at Oxford at the time. And it was when they were there and studying that Davy became very sick. And in a matter of months, Davy was gone. And you can understand how that shining barrier around their love showed all kinds of cracks. And there was all kind of invasions on their love for one another. And the book takes its name from a letter that C.S. Lewis wrote because he kind of took him under his wing and actually wrote 15 letters in this book to Sheldon, leading him to Christ, telling him and helping him to understand the the various contours of the Christian faith. And he, he describes the pain and the suffering and the grief that Sheldon was going through as a severe mercy from God. Listen to how he says. He says, That death so full of suffering for us both, suffering that still overwhelmed my life, was yet a severe mercy, a mercy as severe as death, a severity as merciful as love. And here's why this story, I think, is is so powerful. is because Sheldon began to understand, through in large part through the discipleship of C.S. Lewis, that their love was idolatrous. And while we might find satisfaction and joy in another human being, we are never taught to find ultimate meaning and satisfaction in another human being. That is only something that Jesus Christ can give to us. And it was Jesus who invaded their lives and began to pull off layer and layer and layer of self-righteousness and selfishness off of Sheldon's heart and take him through a process of grief And Lewis calls that entire process a severe mercy of God. 
You know, the idea of severity and the idea of mercy seem to be at polar opposites and polar ends to one another. How can there be such a thing of a mercy of God with a degree of severity to it? Well, I, I say all this because I believe in the first chapter of Jonah, we find that here. We find there to be, in some sense, a, a severity in God's mercy towards Jonah. Jonah is the running prophet. He is the one who has heard clearly from God to go to, Gen to Nineveh, and what does he do? He, he goes to Joppa, and he hopes to go to Tarshish, as we saw last week, and he wants to flee as far away from God and the mission that God has for him and the oracles that he would preach to a people, honestly, that he hated. He wanted to flee as far away from that as possible, and God meets him here somewhere in the middle of the Mediterranean with mercy, but with severity to it. And it is here that God actually does a work, not just in Jonah's life, but in those that Jonah finds himself, these pagan sailors, that God does a miraculous, merciful work in their lives. So I want to pick up here. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3 just for context. We looked at these last week and then read verse 4 as you see this as we read. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down to it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord." And get what the Lord did. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. I don't want to get too technical in this, but what I want you to see as we go through this is that there's what's called chiasm in this story. And chiasm is shaped after the Greek letter chi, or chi, uh, if you people that were in sororities or fraternities, chi, as you might call it, but the, the Greek letter X is basically what key is. And the idea of chiasm is it poetically takes you to a center point in the story, and then it brings some parallels on the backside of the story to show really what the center of the story is all about. And, and, and if you just follow this, as we'll see in just a moment, you'll see that it is Jonah's confession in verse 9 that is the very center of this story. And so Jonah and God himself wants us to see what Jonah has to say in light of the scandalous grace that God has for sinners. And so here in verse 4, we see fear in this storm and fear of this storm. And notice in verse 4, the Lord Yahweh himself is the one of action. He is the one who is doing what Jonah and the sailors are experiencing. There is a storm that is hurled by God, and it is clear that it is God who is in his divine action and providence has hurled this storm in order to bring mercy mercy to Jonah with a degree of severity against it. And literally, quite literally, the Hebrew here is so poetic, the ship is thinking about breaking apart. And so now we have the Lord hurling storms, we have the inanimate thing of the storm, and we have the inanimate thing of the ship, all seeming to work against Jonah as he had gone down to Joppa and to go down to Tarshish to flee from the presence of the Lord. And what you see in verse 4 is that the Lord has none of it. The Lord had a call on Jonah's life, the Lord had a mission for him, and the Lord is going to meet him here in the Mediterranean. And so the purpose of this storm essentially is to remind us of this truth that we see in Psalm 139. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell on the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. And so as a prophet, Jonah knows better, and he is trying to flee from the presence of the Lord, and he knows that that's impossible. But when we are frustrated and mad and depressed and discouraged, oftentimes our emotions do not line up with what that is that we know to be true. 
I mentioned the poem Hound of Heaven last week, and this is exactly how God is pursuing Jonah. That poem reads like this, now of that long pursuit comes on at hand the brute. That voice is around me like a bursting sea, and is thy earth so marred, shattered and shard on shard, lo, all things fly thee, for thou fliest me. You cannot run from the presence of the Lord. And so in verses 5 through 6, we find in the upside-down world of the book of Jonah, the righteous pagan sailors calling out to their gods. In verse 5, then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his god, and they hurled the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and he had lain down and was fast asleep. And so the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will save or give a thought to us that we may not perish. Now, again, one of the topsy-turvy, upside-down things that we see in this book is that Jonah is supposed to be the righteous one. Jonah is not the righteous one. He's not the one praying. He's not the one doing anything of the sorts. He's not opening his mouth, giving the oracles of God. He's not doing prophet things. Rather, he is down in the cargo hold of the ship, fast asleep, neglecting all the danger that he has around him, and honestly neglecting the danger that the mariners had around them. And what are they doing? They're crying out to their gods. They're saying, God, save us. Very likely, they are crying out to Baal, the storm god, who, in their worldview, had brought the storm to them. And they're saying, what can we do to appease your wrath? What is it that we might do to escape this wrath? We are crying out to you. And what are they doing? They are hurling the cargo. Now, here's one of the ironic features of the story. The Lord hurled the storm, and now the sailors are hurling the cargo overboard. And it's very likely as they go down to find more cargo to throw overboard that that's where they discover Jonah. And they go, oh, yeah, we forgot about you. Where have you been all this time? Call out to your God. Arise, the same word that the Lord gave to Jonah to arise and to go to Nineveh. Now we have the sailor saying, arise, call out to your God. Maybe he will have mercy upon us. Now, again, I think that what Jonah has done is he has gone down into the ship and he wants to get as far away from the Lord as possible. And you see his response really in this passivity. He is in a deep slumber. He is in a deep sleep. And the word sleep oftentimes in the Bible is a euphemism for death. And so Jonah, in effect, is saying, I really wish I was just dead on this ship. Get it over with already. I want to be dead. He's depressed. he's, He's got all kinds of things going on in his soul. And he is sleeping on the boat. And he's dealing with that depression. And not only that... He's not praying at all. He is not a praying prophet. And so as you continue to go on in the story, you see the center part of the story in verse 9. But let's read verses 7 through 9 together. And they said to one another, these are the sailors, Come, let us cast lots that we might know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, which is kind of a primitive force of di- form of dice, and the lot fell on Jonah. And then they said to him, they essentially interrogate him with five questions, rapid fire, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you? And now listen to Jonah's response. And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and dry land. That is quite the theologically accurate statement. And it's in contrast with these pagan sailors who are showing their humanity and their fear, and they're calling out to the Lord. 
And so you get the story here. They cast lots. Again, it's kind of a, a, an ancient Near Eastern uh, a way to discern God's will or the will of the gods. And somehow these dice or these lots fall upon Jonah and they deduce immediately that it is on Jonah's account that, get this, the evil has fallen upon them. Now, remember in chapter 1, at the very beginning of this chapter, God calls Jonah to arise because the evil of the Ninevites has ascended up to him. Now, ironically, it is Jonah who is bringing the evil upon the sailors. And it is Jonah, the righteous prophet, who brings the wickedness, or the evil, I should say, upon them. Now, what do we make of Jonah's response here? You know, on one level, we could read this and we could say, you know, maybe Jonah's not so bad. I mean, he's, he's got some good theology going here. And maybe he's somewhat pious in the way he says this. Maybe he kind of holds his hands, you know, together like a really righteous saint would. And, and he, he gives an account for who he worships. And he gives an account for his occupation. And he gives an account for what he is doing there. But I don't think that's the way you're supposed to read this. What in Jonah's character have we seen so far that would bring us to an understanding that he is a pious prophet? Nothing. In fact, it's somewhat callous in the way he says it. He's, I don't know who you're calling out to, but my God, you know, I mean, he's the maker of heaven and earth. Oh, the sea, which we're on, and the dry land. And my friends, this is one of those classic examples of where we can have precise theology and our hearts can be as hard and far from God as possible. Now, I'm an advocate, of course, for good theology. I mean, that's what we do on Wednesday nights in our Knowing God Bible studies. I mean, it, that's what this church in many ways is built upon. We have our 21-point doctrinal statement on our website for you to go read. I mean, it is precise. It is a walled garden, if you will, for our thinking. And that, of course, is essential, and we're not going to neglect good theology, but hear me when I say this. You can have all the right theology and know all the right things and not know the God of heaven and earth. Jonah was that kind of prophet. Another thing about Jonah is that his sin was not occurring in this vacuum. It's kind of like an alcoholic. An alcoholic takes another drink, and that drink in the alcoholic's mind is, well, it's just affecting me, right? It's just affecting my life. But we know from alcoholism and those that struggle with alcohol, their lives leave a wake of destruction behind them. And, 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 and it's no different if you have a gambling addiction. It's no different if you have a movie addiction or whatever it is. There can be little things or big things in our lives that, that leave a wake of destruction. And Jonah really thinks his running from the presence of the Lord is just simply his problem. But his problem now became their problem. <laughs> And the ship was thinking about breaking apart. And Jonah's attitude towards the sailors, what's it to you? What's wrong with you guys? Whatever. He's got the divine name of the Lord. He, he has perfect theology. His heart is hard to his mission. Now, listen to more questioning of Jonah on the backside of this. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? And the sea grew more and more tempestuous. tempestuous. <laughs> That's how you would say that. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. So they go and they question Jonah. They question him further, and they become alarmed because Jonah, I don't know if he admits this as a sign of weakness or what, 
But he says, I'm trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. And the sailors go, say, what? <laughs> You're trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. And they become incredibly afraid. So their fear is compounded now with the revelation that Jonah is a prophet and Jonah is trying to do something that it is impossible for him to do, to flee from the presence of the one true God. And so you start seeing in this story that there's a severity here, but there's also a mercy that's being extended to these sailors. And they're starting to come to the realization that the false gods that they are crying out to will not save them. But Jonah here in his piety, in his false piety at least, says, hurl me into the sea. So God hurls the storm. The sailors hurl the cargo. Now Jonah says, hurl me. Now, I've always read this, and I've always thought about Jonah's solution to this problem as somewhat ironic, but also callous. Jonah says, hey, it's on account of me that this problem has come into this world, and your world is falling apart. Why doesn't he just jump in? <laughs> Why does he have to make them an accomplice to murder? I mean, you think about this. I mean, just end it already. You, you basically want to die? Just, just, just end it already. And Jonah's saying, well, you've got to do it. I mean, it is so callous. And it is so hardened. And so, again, we see this. There, there is this lesson here that spiritual piety doesn't really matter unless it's true and based upon a truth of knowing the Lord. And, and here, the, the, the sailors, ironically, are being shaped and moved mysteriously by God's mercy, and that they were sincere in calling out to their gods, but now they are showing fear to the Lord and respect and honor. And it seems like they're coming around to this. And sooner, sooner than later, their, their fear of the Lord is, I believe, going to be saving. And God is using Jonah mysteriously in all of this, the hardened prophet, that God would use us in some ways the same way. And so we come now to the sailors and their prayer to the one true God. It is absolutely amazing what's happening in this story in verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous, tempestuous I can't say that, tempestuous, I think, you're going to correct me later, against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. That's amazing. That's an amazing prayer. Quite literally, they are taking their oars and they are digging into the water. In a sense, they're digging, digging the watery grave. For Jonah the prophet. And, and they come to a, an understanding and, and an acknowledgement that they can't overcome the storm and they must do something. And they come to faith in this Lord that Jonah professes and they ask for forgiveness from this same Lord and they say, Lord, have mercy upon us for let us not perish on this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you. And so you see the sailors here do something that they didn't want to do. They followed through. <laughs> they are the righteous ones in this story. A bunch of pagan sailors who are hardened men, grizzled pirates probably on the sea, on their way to Tarshish. They've encountered storms before, but not like this. And then verse 15 and 16, you see the fear of the Lord come back again. So it was fear of the storm, now it's the fear of the Lord. So they picked up Jonah... And here's that word again, hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. And then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. It's an incredible story of conversion. Now, it's not uncommon when sailors would come in the ancient world to port, they would offer some sort of sacrifice perhaps, or visit the local temple for the local deity and to offer a sacrifice. I don't know what it is they offer as a sacrifice on this boat, but as the winds die down and the sea stops literally walking and breaking up the ship, they offer a sacrifice right then and there. There is something that happens in their hearts 
that demands a follow-through of faith and obedience right there. It's not a, you know, maybe we'll wait and get to port and like have this conversation. Maybe we'll seek out other prophets. No, they have an encounter with the one true living God and they immediately respond in faith. And so let me just say, friends, if your heart is responding to what God is teaching you even in this moment, don't you dare suppress that. Respond immediately to what God is calling to you, even in this moment of repentance that God is calling you to. For we don't know what tomorrow holds. These sailors, they are the ones that seem to have virtue and piety in this story. Now in verse 17, this is what we all know from the story of Jonah, the whale of a tale, as it's often said. And in Hebrew, this is actually chapter 2, verse 1 in the Hebrew Old Testament, but here it's verse 17 in your English text. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I think much to his chagrin. (laughs) Jonah thought... Finally, this thing is over. I've run from the presence of the Lord. What does the Lord do? He appoints this fish. We'll talk about it next week. What in the world's going on here? Swallows Jonah. And we find in conclusion to this narrative that Jonah is now in the belly of this whale for three days and three nights. Or perhaps part of a day, all of a day, and part of another day. You think about this, it's usually the grave that swallows the man, but here the fish swallows Jonah. And there's so much ironic ironic aspects to this story. Let me pull out three, I think, timeless truths for us from chapter one. Number one, God disciplines those he loves with a severe mercy. This isn't the feel good, put it on a coffee mug kind of verse, you know, and truth that we think about, but it's true. God loves us so much that he won't let us run from him. He will discipline us with a severity sometimes that is clothed in mercy and love. Sometimes we think in our culture that discipline is being mean. We discipline our children. We don't want to discipline them right. No, that's not true. Discipline is actually from the Lord. It is loving. It is corrective. It it brings us back into conformity to his will. Uh, Hebrews 12 says, in effect, that the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. Read the story about a little boy uh, carving a little piece of wood, and it's telling the story from the little pieces of wood's perspective. And he's carving it, and he's cutting it, and he's putting all these little holes out of it, and his goal is to make this flute. And the little piece of wood is starting to really kind of protest all of these painful shavings and all these things that's going on. And so he says, a little piece of wood without these rifts and without these holes and all this cutting, you'd just be a stick forever, a useless piece of wood. What I'm doing now may seem as if I am destroying you, but instead it will change you into a flute. Your sweet music will charm the souls of many and comfort sorrowing hearts. My cutting you is the making of you, for only thus can you be a blessing to the world." Divine mercy in divine discipline is not enjoyable, but it is also necessary because it's through that that God brings us into conformity with his will as he would see fit. Number two, you see this. God is sovereign over all things, and God reaches all of those to whom he wills to reach. One of the beautiful parts of the story is you have this intersection of man's rebellion, man's freedom, and God's sovereignty. And here in chapter 1, it meets on that boat that God had a plan for these sailors. God had a plan for these pagans. God had a plan to bring them to himself, and he used the callous prophet Jonah to do it. Only God could do something like that. That, that is one of those like orchestrations of the divine will that, that I don't understand. And you might ask me, well, how does the divine sovereignty intersect with the human freedom that we have? And, and how does God bring about his complete, total sovereign will in that? And you'd say, would you explain that? And I would say, no, I can't. But I know it's true. I know it's true because I read it here and I see a sovereign God over the weather, over the whales, over the sailors, over everything. God accomplishes his will. 
He does it, and he does it in a merciful way. The last thing I would say is this in conclusion, and I want us to draw our hearts' affections not to the sailors, certainly not to Jonah, but to Jesus. Because one of the themes that runs throughout this book is to contrast Jesus and Jonah. They are like carbon opposites from one another. And so this reminds me a lot of the story from Matthew 8 when Jesus is on the boat in the storm, and the storm, of course, is coming upon the, the, the gent- or the, um, his disciples, and what do they do? They cry out to Jesus. Jesus is asleep on the little boat there. They're threatened. And what do you see? You see a contrast. Jonah is asleep because he was callous and pouting. Jesus was asleep because he was resolved and he was resting. Now, the thing that you see is Jonah wanted to escape his calling. Jesus, however, affirmed his calling, lived in light of his calling. He was resting in it. Jonah wanted to go down in the waters. It is Jesus who calms the waters. Jonah submits to the power of God. Jesus, however, in calming the storm, demonstrates the power of God through him calling our affections and our thoughts and our minds to Jesus, the one who can calm the storms. And the sailors worshiped as well as the disciples worshiped the one true God. And so as we get ready to sing as a church, Christ be magnified in us, that indeed is our prayer, is that Christ would be magnified in our words, in our church, in our message, and that even in the severity of mercy as we might need it from time to time, Christ would be proclaimed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this story. Father, let it penetrate deep in our hearts. We confess to you that we run often like Jonah. We are callous to your ways, to your words that you've given to us. Father, we are harsh people oftentimes. We are gossipy people. We are hurtful people. We have hurt others. But Father, in that rebellion, you meet us and you are merciful. And so, Father, bring us into conformity with your will so that we might affirm and acknowledge Jesus in all ways. It's in his name we pray. Amen.